My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in the Jazz Archive at Hamilton College. It was a privilege to have Dan Morgenstern with me today. And I, I just picked up a little thing from another interview you did, which uh, puts you right with most other jazz musicians, and you said morning is not necessarily the best time for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we are in the morning. Anyway, welcome to Hamilton. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm so glad that I finally got to see your lair here, which is wonderful. I love all the photos. They're different. It's not the standard issue stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really uh, fun what you've been doing here. Yeah. Uh, well, that, coming from you, I appreciate that a lot. I, I got to visit your lair uh, a couple times, and, and I was... Uh, Pretty blown away by all that and it's so interesting that the root jazz has traveled from what essentially was sort of a folk music a popular music to now being um, considered a very high art form yes it's quite a, a sea change and of course there are still although the ranks are dwindling, but there are musicians around who very well remember the days when it was a, the, an audience that took jazz seriously was definitely a minority, and mm -hmm. for most people it was something to dance to, it was something to have fun to, and you know. Uh, was there a, a, what point in jazz history do you think that that really uh, turned around. Well, there was always it, it, early on. I think the first people who started really, you know, taking aside from the musicians themselves, but they started taking it seriously. Uh, strangely enough, uh, <laughs> were the people, uh, a bunch of them at Ivy League colleges, who started collecting jazz records and would go out of their way to find what was then known as race records, which wasn't a pejorative. Race was a term that was used by the NAACP. You know, they talked about the race. And so mm -hmm. when uh, Clarence Williams and Perry Bradford, who was really the pioneers, they were the pioneers in starting this branch of ethnic recording. It, there was precedent because the record labels like Columbia had a whole ethnic series. They were making Greek records, Irish records, Hebrew records, Polish records. No, the, the, and these were uh, marketed in stores that would be frequented by the particular minority. So it was not anything, there was nothing negative about it. It was just the record companies wanting to find a market to sell things. But these people uh, at, 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 there were people at Princeton, and uh, there was, some, you know, Marshall Stearns, at, who was the founder of the Institute of Jazz Studies at Harvard, and, uh, you know, they started going. Uh, how to find these recordings by people like uh, oh Bessie Smith and uh, of course the Armstrong Hot Five and all, which very quickly then entered the, the recording mainstream actually. Mm -hmm. But they were uh, they were the first to, and there were people in Europe also. Uh, Robert Goffin, who was the first to write a. A uh, no, respectable book that attempted to trace the history of the music uh, in 1932, two years before the much more famous Panassier. Uh, so the, the, the late 20s is about when this begins. And at the Institute of Jazz Studies, we have a bunch of, of correspondence that came from. Uh, a man who is not terribly well known uh, because he didn't do much in the way of writing or anything, but he was, when he was in college, he was a very good pianist and he sat in with the Wolverines and New Bix and everything. And uh, the people who early on tried to find out 
about jazz, like uh, Charles Edward Smith, who was one of the pioneer jazz writers in this country, wrote an article called Collecting Hot for Esquire magazine, and I think it was 1933. There is correspondence there where this man uh, knew things about King Oliver and about Big Spiderbeck and so on, and I'm trying to think of his name. It's a senior moment. It'll, it'll come back to me. But there are letters that these people wrote to him, you know, and they were really fishing in the dark because there wasn't any place, you, you, you couldn't really go anywhere. You had to go to the musicians themselves mm -hmm. and ask them, but there was often a question of their being accessible. And King Oliver, who was being discovered on the strength of his wonderful recordings by the Creole Jazz Band, had by then, by 1930, he was off the beaten path. He was working with a band, uh, mostly down south, touring and in the backwoods, and you know, it was in the, uh, his career had really gone. Down. So it was hard to find him to ask him. So this was all being pieced together uh, when uh, Marshall Stearns decided he was a uh, an English lit guy. No, that's how he made his living. He uh, he it's, he got his PhD. Uh, it was a Chaucer specialist uh, from Yale. But he discovered his thesis topic, and this was an obscure Scottish poet named Robert Henderson, and he's writing a little letter, a little note to somebody. And he, he says, I found, you know, I found my topic, and he gives this guy's name, and he says, nobody knows anything about him, just like jazz, you know? <laughs> well, you, uh, you mentioned in Europe, and uh, I'm only partly familiar with, with your story uh, when you were a young boy. And, um, you heard, did you hear jazz in Austria? Well, Austria, which is where I started out, uh, what I heard of jazz was uh, pretty much limited to, as I can tell in retrospect, from records. I like to, my mother had a, a, a wind-up phonograph and I like to play around with that. And also uh, her mother, my mother was one of four Sibling, she was the oldest, but she had two sisters and a brother. And uh, my grandmother had a place in uh, Upper Bavaria. It was near the Austrian border, but she had bought that in 1912 to raise her family. You know, and it was. Uh, uh, I spent my summers there as a kid, and there were a bunch of records that belonged to my mother and her siblings. And there was dance music, but for some that really turns out in retrospect to have been the closest thing to real jazz was by a British trumpet player named Nat Ganella. He was a Armstrong acolyte. When Louis first came to uh, to Europe, he came to England in, in 1932. Who uh, Nat was the first, one of the first to welcome him and took him under his wing, you know, and got him settled in yeah. London and all that. He was an absolute, uh, you know, Louis. Could, but he he had uh, he had an original quality. He had a strange embouchure, like Wild Bill oh. Davidson, off the side of his mouth. Made tons of records, hundreds of records in the 30s. There were big sellers not only in England but in Scandinavia where he visited and in, in Germany where they still had, even under the Nazis, they were not too good at deciding what was jazz and what oh. wasn't. They, they banned it but the records were still available yeah. into uh, until World War II broke out and they started clamping down. But anyway, this record by uh, Nat Gunnella, his theme song was Georgia On My Mind. Oh. And he sings and plays very much in a Louis manner. So that was probably the first thing they made. The other things were pretty, there was some Paul Whiteman records and stuff like that. But then, uh, after leaving Austria, courtesy of Hitler, when he you know, marched in, in March 12, 1938, uh, got out eventually. My mother's father, 
was Danish of birth. So she was Danish born. When she married my father, uh, she did, there was no dual citizenship, but because she had been born Dane, uh, we were, she and I were able to get into Denmark. You were about nine years old? About, I was eight when, uh, when Hitler took over Austria. Uh, I was nine and you know, fairly recent in Copenhagen when my mother, bless her, decided that I might enjoy a Fats Waller concert. Fats was touring Scandinavia and uh, she uh, got tickets for Fats Waller in 1938, in the fall of 1938, and that was my first, you know, real, that was Fats Waller. You know, he was doing a single, he started out, he, uh, the, the concert opened with him jamming with some Danish musicians, and then they left and he took over by himself. I didn't have much English then, but, uh, you know, his, you know, uh, his energy, his eyebrows going up and down, the way he, you know, looked into the audience, while his feet pumping and the rhythm, you know, of it, and the great piano playing and thing. Uh, it was, it was really quite wonderful, and I won't say that I became a jazz convert overnight, but naturally I wanted to get, you know, Fats Waller records and stuff like that. I, that started. I had a, a bunch of records already, so... Can you recall, as an eight-year-old, understanding why you had to leave the country? Oh, yes. I, uh, I, I understood that. I mean, I didn't understand it on a very, you know, highly sophisticated level, but uh, absolutely knew... Uh, we still didn't know at that time, you know, that that was before the Holocaust, really. It was before, uh, 1942 was really when, uh, when that really evil stuck up, but it was bad enough as it, uh -huh. as it was. I remember even before, when I was about six or so, my, uh, one of my aunts had a boyfriend uh, who was, this was at my grandmother's place, and like everybody of a certain age there, uh, he was uh, forced into uh, doing stuff for the government, and he was actually uh, in a labor kind of labor gang that, uh, not full time, but they were working on building the famous Autobahn uh, and he had to wear a kind of uniform thing with a swastika armband and I remember him uh, arriving at my grandmother's and tearing off this thing and throwing it in a corner and saying, you know, uh, uh, as if it was something, you know, something dirty. He left very soon after he wanted my aunt to come with him. He went to Australia, he emigrated to Australia. So he was a, a, a non-Jewish, he was an Aryan anti-Nazi, you know, and, and, and there was conversation, you know, pretty constant about uh, what the Nazis represented. My father was a writer. Uh, he had been a Viennese cultural correspondent for a major German newspaper, the Frankfurter Zeitung, which actually was started by my great great grandfather. And uh, so once the Nazis took over, uh, the paper was was Jewish owned, but you know, 
uh, they were stripped of it, and my father uh, lost his job. My father had been born in uh, what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but uh, later, after World War I, became Poland. Now it's Ukraine, you know, it's right on the border there. But my father was born actually not even in what they call a shtetl, which is like a little village, but he was born in the country, out in the country. But he was born into a religious Jewish family that were Hasidim, and uh, so he was raised that way. And then, of course, he went to Vienna to study, and uh, he became a, a more a cosmopolitan, so to speak. Um, he was he was a great uh, music lover. He had played cello as a young man in his school orchestra. He actually became the first cellist, but he'd given that up. And, but he became a close friend of Alban Berg, so I remember Berg, who died when I was uh, six years old. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I remember him well because he was a close friend and. and the, Sometimes my father and he would take me to, they were soccer fans and oh. we'd go to soccer games. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask and, you about a word you used uh, when you were describing your father's uh, family? They, they were religious and you used a word, Kassidim. Uh, yeah, well they are, they're the kind of, you know, uh, really uh, seriously uh, religious uh, where the, uh, uh, the curls the curls yeah. and the hats okay. and so on but my his my father my, my my grandfather my paternal grandfather uh, was uh, very he uh, unlike most to see them who are very insular he was aware of the fact, he said to my father, if you want to make your way in the world, you have to learn, you know, you have to know German, you have to know, you have to be educated in the, you know, the, the Western civilization, so to speak. So he allowed, which was unusual, he allowed my father to go to what they call the gymnasium, which is like a kind of overlapping late high school, early college, you know, the educational system is somewhat different there. And, and he allowed my father to, to go to Vienna and, and uh, get his study. He actually, he insisted that he study law because he didn't want him to, uh, you know, get into uh, something more, you know, uh, uh, suspect in the oh. sense that my grandfather died very, very early in, in my father's life. My father was uh, in his teens still when he was uh, killed in an accident that involved a runaway horse. He was, uh, my, my grandfather was an overseer of uh, farm operations for a Polish noblewoman who owned a lot of the land around the little village where my father was born. So he was an unusual person in this kind of you know environment, uh, most most uh, other Jewish families were much more, as I say, much more insular. But he was already you know somebody who himself had uh, stepped out of that kind of restrictive environment and become part of the overall. So my father uh, was very conscious of being Jewish, he was very much aware of what was going on with Hitler. And, you know, even in Austria, there was the, the uh, uh, there was a heavy Nazi party in, in Austria, and there were Austrian fascists, there was this guy named Dolphus who was assassinated in, uh, in 1934, uh, who was kind of a, he, he, he didn't like Hitler, he didn't like the Nazis, but he was, he was supported by Mussolini, actually, but he was a. There was he was very anti-social democrat. There was almost a civil war in Vienna in 1934, with shooting and killing and stuff. For the, so you know, the, everything of, was shaky. Yeah, and I wonder, did some of your extended family, aunts, uncles, etc., not 
take advantage of the opportunity to get out at that time? Uh, m most of them, my father's uh, sister, his youngest brother was killed in World War I. He was a soldier, he was an Austrian soldier, he was killed by the Russians he, on the Russian front. Uh, he had a, another brother and two sisters, but, and uh, his mother, of course, after my grandfather had died, was still there. Uh, when the war broke out, World War I, that is, uh, my father went and got them all out of there because it was very near the Russian border and they were afraid of the Russian because the Russians were noted for pogroms against Jews, you know, they, they were not, not all of them, but the Cossacks and the, so it was a dangerous situation. So he went back and got them, brought them all, they, they all settled in Vienna. So they were initially, uh, you know, they, they were, uh, they, they, they were not captured when World War II broke out, but, but, unfortunately, uh, some got away to Czechoslovakia, some of my relatives, uh, and eventually made their way to what was then Palestine. But uh, my father's one sister and one brother and his mother were all, uh, they were all uh, victims of the Holocaust. And you yourself had a, after, I guess after going to Denmark, there was an underground system. Yeah, well, in, actually, this is uh, this is April 9th, is it not? It is April 9th today. It is indeed. April 9th was the day that the Germans occupied Denmark, April 9th, 1940. I remember it very well because it was the second time in my life that uh, Nazis marched into a city that I was living in. And when I was in Vienna, I had scarlet fever at the time of, of the Anschluss. Uh, but I remember uh, that was considered a serious illness then, and that was one reason why my mother stayed with me and my father had to get out in a hurry. So he, he split and went to France. That's a whole other story. But I remember the yelling and screaming, you know, the, the Viennese, uh, they would like to forget about that now, but uh, the majority welcomed Hitler, you know, with, uh, and I remember that noise from the, you know, everybody screaming Heil, you know. Uh, and then on April 9th, 1940, I was asleep, and when I, my bedroom had sort of a slanted uh, window. Uh, we were living on the top floor of a building in Copenhagen and there was like one room that had this, it was almost like a, it would have been a good place for a painter, you know, for a studio because there was plenty of light. And when I woke up, I, I heard planes and I, I looked out and I could see the German, you know, the, uh, the that cross that they had on the wings oh, there, and then the swastika on the tail. So there, that that was the Germans coming into Denmark, uh, which was not a happy, you know, uh, awakening. Uh, they, the planes dropped leaflets and uh, said that the Germans had come to protect Denmark against, uh, you know the British and the uh, uh, Anyway, that it was interesting because the uh, early part of the occupation, uh, the Germans needed Denmark as a larder. Denmark was a major producer and exporter of foods, uh, dairy products, uh, and, uh, and and pork especially, bacon and others, and eggs and, and uh, butter, milk, and everything, and the Germans could use all that stuff. And everything. So, so they, behaved, they called the Denmark, they called it a, uh, that was like their, their window to the world that they could behave themselves, you know, which, which they did for a while, you know. Uh, but uh, in spite of that, uh, there were all kinds of things that happened uh, which 
the Danes did not relish and the underground developed gradually and also the Germans started behaving, you know, uh, differently. But in 1943, in the fall of 1943, uh, they decided to round up all the Jews in Denmark. It wasn't a very large population, but the underground was prepared for that, and they had managed to obtain the list that the Germans had of whom they were going to arrest. And uh, so, I mean, this is, I, I don't really want to get into <laughs> we want to talk about jazz, I guess, but, you know, uh, what happened was at four o'clock in the afternoon and one day, and uh, it was in, in, in September, I guess, uh, or early, early October, it's before my birthday, uh, knocked on the door, opened the door, and there was this nice young man uh, who said, may I come in, I have something important to talk to you about. And uh, he gave my mother and I instructions, detailed instructions about what to do, where to go, don't, you know, don't pack anything except maybe an overnight thing. And don't tell anybody, we will inform people about what, don't worry about what's in your apartment, just get out and meet at a certain place and then we met there with other people and they gave us some money and for travel and told us what tickets to get on a train. The whole thing was very well organized. As it happened, the first attempt did fail and then there was about a period of almost a week when uh, I was planted at different people's homes overnight and stuff and then we got out to Sweden, which is this narrow body of water between Denmark and Sweden. And uh, the Swedes, who were neutral, uh, uh, accepted both Norwegian and Danish. Uh, Norway was also occupied by Germans, refugees, and so uh, came to Sweden in, the f in October of '43 and spent a year and a half until the war ended in Sweden and then went back to Denmark. And my father, in the meantime, had adventures in France where he was interned by the French and eventually almost the French turned that internment camp over to the Germans, but he managed to get away and made his way to Vichy. He was in uh, Marseille and was, uh, assisted by this great American uh, named, what was his name, Vartan Fry. He was a, he was a, uh, a civilian. He didn't have any, uh, the State Department was very ambiguous about helping Jewish refugees. You know, it was limited what they would accept. But he went to Marseille and he had, he managed to get a lot of people out, including my father. Uh, got my father a Honduran passport, which was something that you could <laughs> you could buy. Uh, went to Morocco and from Morocco to Lisbon, and he had long ago applied for an American visa, but uh, because of all the things that happened. Uh, but once he got to Portugal, he was able to get a uh, you know entry permit to the United States and got out in April of 41 and that was before Pearl Harbor so we were still we were in Denmark but in all the time that he was roaming around in France and Morocco and so on it was not it would not have been a good idea for him to write to us because the Germans censored all the mail that came from overseas, you know, from other countries. But once he arrived here, uh, he was able to communicate with us and, and we knew that he was okay. Gosh, it must have been sure. quite an event when you finally got a letter yeah. from him. Uh, so since he came here in 41, uh, he became a citizen in uh, after five years in 46, and then he was able to get my mother and I to, you know, 
come here in 47. So I arrived in in the USA uh, in April, April 21st, 1947. <laughs> well, I appreciate you telling me that saga. I, I find it extremely interesting. And, um... Well, the Danes were marvelous. You know, they, they did all this, obviously taking great risks uh, as if it was the most natural thing to do. And it got almost everybody out. Uh, uh, the people who didn't get out mostly made mistakes and didn't follow instructions and that's why they were caught. So. Okay, well I'm gonna in the time I have then I'm gonna <laughs> leapfrog I have a little but only a little bit because I I, I wanted to ask you about um, young young Dan goes to Harlem, you know, and you were I had heard a radio interview that you did about going up to Harlem and and checking out the music and stuff. Oh, well. So that's just, I wonder what, can you describe like one of, one of what a night would be like for you? Well, this was, you know, not too terribly long after I uh, came to New York and I had uh, met this little underground trumpet player named Nat Lorber. His nickname was Face. I knew everybody, everybody knew him. Uh, and uh, also uh, met a very hip young lady who was the first to take me to the Apollo Theater in Harlem and that actually turned out to be a night when Dizzy's big band was appearing there with Chana Pozo so I got to see that which was tremendous. Uh, the Apollo was one thing of course uh, the Apollo was frequented to some extent by, you know, there was always a number of white people in the audience. There was, a, uh, And, you know, what I heard when I first came to New York, you know, because my father knew that I was, you know, I was a jazz fan and all that, but people were saying, you know, his, it's, you know, risky to go to Harlem, don't go to Harlem at night and, da, 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 okay. and all that. You know. But uh, when you were, uh, with musicians, uh, there was no problem at all. So, you know, going to places, uh, Harlem never was, although, you know, you, you have the famous Mintons, you have the Savoy, which had a tremendous history of, uh, during the big band era, uh, in terms of jazz, and, uh, but it wasn't really, uh, years later when I, came to Chicago uh, when I was with Downbeat. I went to the Chicago South Side, which was the, the black neighborhood. Uh, there was a lot more jazz activity there than there really was in Harlem. But there were, there were spots, of course. There were a lot of musicians who lived there. And the Savoy was still going, but it wasn't what it used to be. Uh, but there were little clubs, and there was this wonderful trumpet player and, and singer named Hot Lips Page. And Lips was my, my friend, Nat, was a kind of protege of uh, Lips's. Lips was from Texas, and he didn't call him Face, but he called him Shorty, which he pronounced Shouty. That was his, his Texas accent. And going on a you know, going to Harlem with lips, lips lived there, he, uh, was, you know, a wonderful experience. There were after hours places, and the after hours places could be somebody's apartment where there was an old upright piano and, and you know, uh, a refrigerator full of uh, ice and cold beer and then bottles of whiskey and you know you paid something at the door and then you paid for what you drank and people musicians would come in and play it would be like a jam session and there were also there was a place right near Minton's actually which was the basement of a hotel the Braddock I guess which was an after hours place but it was like a it, it, it was like a fully equipped nightclub it was really but it didn't start, you know, until three thirty, four in the morning, which was after the clubs closed, and uh, 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 and then there were the 
<clears throat> and then there were the so-called social clubs, which also had permission to operate after hours and had liquor licenses. And there you would, uh, you know, uh, there was a, when you came in, there was a desk and then you, you would become a member. You could join, you know, you get a membership card, you pay something. Like I remember one night going to a place like that with lips and... Uh, uh, it was downstairs, first you came in and, you know, we got your membership and you know, went downstairs. And uh, they had, uh, you know, they had food and drink. As their chick- chicken in the basket was a big thing in Harlem. And those, that and ribs. And it's a tremendous. Rib. There was a place where they had the best potato salad I ever had in my life. It's great. But anyway, uh, the music, well, there, there, there was a, there was a piano there, and at the piano, it must have been my lucky night because at the piano was none other than Art Tatum. I've written about that, but I think Tatum was at the piano on the floor sitting at his feet with Charlie Shavers, a great trumpet player and a terrific, what a great guy Charlie was, and, and Joe Bushkin. Uh, and uh, I remember, you know, Art was playing, and you know, Art wasn't totally blind. He had peripheral vision. Uh, actually, he was a very good pinochle player. He could, uh, Roy Eldridge, who was very friendly with with Art, told me that he would hold his cards in a certain way, you know, and he would be able to to see. And and, and Roy said he was hot. He was a good pinochle player. He could take advantage of him. Uh, but anyway, he was, you know, he kind of looked down at the two guys sitting at his feet, and he said to Charlie Shavers, he said, any notes you play, I play figure eights around it. <laughs> it's just, That's great. It's great. And That's great. at one of the tables, at one of the tables, eating some, some chicken was Billy Holiday. So, you know, I mean, Harlan could be... That that wasn't something that happened every night, and there were also places like Lips knew all these places. There were places that were really like uh, you know, uh, they called them buckets of blood, and then uh, neighborhood joints frequented by working class people. You know, uh, pretty rough. I remember one had a turnstile at the bar so that you couldn't get out before you paid your bill. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that was called the Locust Club, but they had a little they had a little bench then, and they had a guy there who was a pretty good tenor player, but he was noted for falling asleep on the bandstands late in the evening. And Lips was a great jam session guy, you know. That was that was his. Uh, he uh, he was loved everywhere he went, and he was good. So you know, if you were with Lips, uh, you were welcome anywhere. I see, because the, uh, the social club then was integrated. Uh, to an extent, yes. I mean, the, but, but you know, the white people you would see that would like Joe Bushkin would be musicians yeah. or you know people who were pretty hip, you know, right. like. Uh, I think with Joey uh, was the Johnny DeVries who was a uh, uh, sometime uh, a uh, uh, lyricist. He wrote lyrics to some songs. Right. Was friendly with Eddie Condon and that bunch right. of people. Lips would play at Eddie Condon's had a jam session night on Tuesday nights, not Mondays, but Tuesdays, and Lips was very often a guest there. Uh, Condon's was one of the few places in the village that was, you know, the the band was integrated. I had Edmund Hall and clarinet, and you know, uh, and it was uh, it was a pretty hip place. Condon's. Condon was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Well, you must have been on your way to becoming pretty hip yourself. Even maybe you didn't even realize it, but I had no thought at that time of becoming in any way, you know, professionally involved in the music. But I was, you know, uh, it was like 52nd Street was in its final stages, but it was still alive. And, you know, it was no small thing to have Sidney Bechet 
at Jimmy Ryan's and across the street maybe Charlie Parker if you were lucky and he was in town and you know Billy Holiday at the Onyx Club or so. so there was still a lot going on and this was you know it, it was it's still a, a, a vibrant time there was downtown on weekends there was the Stuyvesant Casino in the Central Plaza where these guys, Bob Maltz and Jack Crystal, was Billy Crystal's father, you know, uh, they booked uh, musicians that were available for relatively little, because this was the time when bebop had come in and a lot of swing era musicians were not that well employed, you know, guys who with, with big names, I mean, you know, Buck Clayton, you had Roy Eldridge, you had Hot Lips Page, you even had Coleman Hawkins once in a while, you had Sidney Bechet, certainly you had a whole bunch of people, you know. And uh, that was uh, a buck and a quarter, and uh, it was what they called a beer racket, and so far, you know, there, there was beer, was about the only beverage that you could buy there, but you bought pitches of beer, and, uh, you know, and, and there was dancing. And uh, a lot of the customers were young kids from Brooklyn and the Bronx who liked to go dance and also to pick up girls. And our girls would come and, uh, you know, to, to pick up guys. <laughs> there is a short film called Jazz Dance that was uh, shot at the, uh, at the Central Plaza that gives you some of the flavor there. Willie the Lion Smith is in it and Jimmy McPartland. So bands were great. So, so anyway, I mean, I was hooked on this stuff, but I still did not have any. I, uh, I, I, was, I wanted to be a journalist. I uh, had a job at, my father got me a job at Time Inc. I was kind of a trainee. There's not much more than a glorified messenger, but I, you know, got to meet a lot of people. I actually ran, I was talked into running for office at the American Newspaper Guild, the pretty left-wing thing there. I was, uh, I was a Wallace, uh, you know, uh, Henry Wallace was running for president. That was that famous election oh, when Truman defeated. Truman and Dewey, you know, yeah. oh. and uh, and uh, it was a great experience because I was working at Timing. I was at a nerve center there on election night, which was the studio uh, where they were broadcasting, uh, and uh, there was a guy named H. V. Kaltenborn, who was a uh, he was something similar to the people they now have on Fox News. You know, he was a real right winger, and of course a great Dewey supporter. And as the news came in, it was just amazing what was happening there because nobody could believe it when it came in that Truman was winning, and Kaltenborn, who you know had a kind of you know a complexion, he turned red as a beet. I thought. You know, he was going to have a heart attack or something. <laughs> it, was, the, the, it was quite a way to, you know, it was a great education for uh, American politics. But anyway, I mean, I, 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 I then my father was had become very friendly with the great cartoonist Al Hirschfeld, who had a circle of, you know, friends that a lot of the New York Times people. So my father, who had been a, you know, also been a theater critic, and uh, became friendly with Brooks Atkinson, who was the New York Times first string drama critic, and he used to take my father to openings because he said my father was the only person he knew who would not ask him at intermission. Well, what do you think? You know, which is a terrible thing to do when somebody is trying to, you know. Right. does not want that, so they became great friends. And Bursa got me a, a, a job as copy boy at the New York Times, which I didn't realize then was a pretty big deal, you know, that that's very coveted. But at the time I'd been there about three months, I got drafted. Oh. So when I got drafted, my father was very nervous because he'd been, you know, he was uh, not happy about my hanging out late at night, you know, I mean, sometimes even not coming home at all. So far. <laughs> anyway, he thought that I would be, I would not be fit for army duty, but uh, they're all right. And uh, so that was a 
kind of a sea change. And then when I came out, I went on a GI Bill. I went to Brandeis University. And uh, even then, I had no thoughts about getting into jazz as a, a any kind of professional way. But I started, I eventually, I became editor of the school paper mm-hmm. called The Justice. And there was a little... Brandeis was very new then. It started, and the first class was the class of, uh, let's see, 52. Uh, and there were only about, all undergrads, uh, no graduate school then, about 700 students, a wonderful faculty, and there was some money for student activities with the very few jazz fans, but got together and decided to get some money for to bring jazz to campus. So we hooked up with George Wayne, who then was uh, running Storyville. This is before Newport, mm-hmm. just before, it, just at the cusp of Newport, 1950. Actually, the year of Newport started, 54. So we went to George and asked if we could, you know, ask uh, some uh, people who were appearing at Storyville to come to uh, come to Burns. He said, "You can do it. Get anybody you want. If they want to come, you can talk to them." Uh, but it has to be on a Saturday afternoon because on Sunday I have a Sunday afternoon. Uh, he had the, the club downstairs called Mahogany Hall, which was the traditional club, mm-hmm. and upstairs was Storyville. And on Sunday afternoons, both bands would play, and then at the end there would be some get together. Oh, so the one most remarkable thing that involved that kind of a Sunday afternoon was when Art Tatum's trio was upstairs and Sidney Bechet was downstairs and for the jam for, they got together and played uh, Sidney sat in with the tr- Tatum trio and they played Lady Be Good and that was an but <laughs> This I was, could, could on the occasion, that was also the, the real coup. We brought Stan Getz with that, he had uh, Brooke Meyer, we brought them to campus, and that was very nice, but there was no, I became friendly with Stan later, much later, but it was very, you know, it was kind of impersonal. They came, they played, they played very well, the students liked it, but that was in and out. Yeah. But then uh, uh, we wanted to get Tatum, and I really wanted Tatum without the trio. I wanted him to do solo. And uh, we went to talk to him, and he immediately said yes. And so we uh, were able to bring Tatum to. Brandeis is about 16 miles out of Boston. You know, it's in Waltham, it's easy to get to. And we thought we got the best piano on campus and got it tuned to a T and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, we picked him up in Boston, drove him to campus, and uh, he played a marvelous concert. One of the people who showed up was Machito, who happened to be somewhere in the area, and he found out about it. <laughs> yes, the percussionist? And, uh, uh, the, the leader of that great Latin band, yes. Machito. You okay. know, he was the play- Charlie Parker recorded with right. them and everybody. Uh, Frank Grillo was his real name, Machito. Oh. Uh, and all the classical people, uh, Brandeis had a pretty heavy uh, classical faculty. Uh, uh, with some fairly well-known composers and they all came to to see Tatum and he played a marvelous concert. Uh, Downbeat had a correspondent then and Ned Hentoff had left already uh, and that was Dom Cerulli. He reviewed it for Downbeat actually. This was in 1955, the year before Tatum died. And this was, you know, in order to get people to come to these things, I would write something in the paper Mm -hmm. about them. And that was really my first jazz writing. And then uh, um, when we drove Tatum back to Boston, uh, I was sitting with him in the back, my friends were driving, and I... And I said to him, you know, I thanked him, uh, and uh, uh, he said, 
uh, I should thank you, he said, because, and this totally, you know, overwhelmed me. He said, this is the first time I played a solo concert all by myself, meaning that he had done solo concerts before, but it was always on some kind of double bill. You know, he would be, he might be the opening act and then there would be something. You know, Norman Grants was his manager for a while. I mean, he booked him uh, when during the jazz of the Philharmonic days. and it was a day. So there are things like that, but, or he would appear, you know, in, in, in concert with his trio, but said this is the first time he had done so that completely floored me. And that's when I sort of started, not right away, but it started me thinking about, you know, trying to do something for this music because there was a genius like that and he was not, he was yeah. not adequately recognized. Uh, you know. Tatum had, died a year later. He wow. died in '56. Amazing. Yeah. That, that's a great aha moment, sort of. And I, I had that myself along the way here when, the first couple times, some veteran musicians that I was interviewing, would, ask me about, coming to the campus to play, and in a sense they were, trying to get a gig, and I remember thinking, wow this person here who's had this long career, you make make these assumptions like they must be doing great. They probably can stop working if they want. Definitely not the case. Um, but I wanted to uh, ask you about the writing of liner notes and what kind of parameters... Do, first of all, you're hired by the record label usually? Yeah, usually. I mean, my... my my career as a line of notes writer began when my friend Don Schlitten, who was a Don was a noted producer, uh, uh, he was then with Prestige, and he asked me to do notes. See, I went to after I got out of Brandeis, I went. I I, I was at the New York Post. I was an editorial assistant in the so-called drama department, which was music, film, and so on. I didn't get to, I got to write one thing that was the first thing that was ever printed of mine, actually, uh, was a review of a Randall's Island Festival night uh, in the New York Post. But then I, uh, you know, I eventually left there when I was offered the job at Metronome, you know, and I, that, 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 that's when I became a full-fledged jazz writer. Before that, I had started writing for a British magazine, mm -hmm. Jazz Journal, who wrote them a monthly news column, and uh, that, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, Don asked me to do notes for a not particularly uh, glamorous enterprise. It was an album by Willis Jackson, the tenor player, uh, and it was called Neapolitan Nights. The program was all Italian-derived tunes, okay? <laughs> so that was kind of neat to write about because I, you know, had to link this up with, uh, you know, with jazz and uh, the history of that, you know, come back to Sorrento by Vito Musso, you know, as in order to... Uh, but, uh, uh, that was the beginning, and Jesus, I mean, I c couldn't have made a living on this because Prestige at the time was paying 35 bucks for liner notes. This was in 1962, oh, wow. 1962. So it was a little more than it is now, but, uh, and, and Prestige was one of the lower paying labels. Uh, so I've, I, I did a bunch of stuff for Don, uh, most of it of a more elevated artistic nature than Neapolitan Nights, uh, reissues and, and, and especially reissues, that, that became my first specialty sort of. And uh, Don was doing a series of uh, stuff, masters that they had leased from other labels, you know. And, uh, so. That was the beginning, and then when I 
metronome folded very quickly. I had the dubious distinction of being the last editor of metronome, but it didn't fold because of anything that we'd done wrong. Actually, it was a very good magazine, if I may say so. But the publisher uh, had it as a tax write-off from his business. He was had an electronic services company. This was 1960. One, uh, in the relatively early days of things like computers and so on, so electronic servicing was a fairly new enterprise, and he was doing fairly well at it. But what happened then was that his biggest client, I forget who they were, big man, said that either you become exclusively ours or we will take our business elsewhere. So he was forced to become, rather than an independent operator, to become a branch of this other major manufacturer, which changed his tax picture so he could no longer write the magazine off. And that's when he came to us and said, because uh, he, he was an ex-musician. He had been a tenor and clarinet player in the 20s. And he actually, I found out, I made a correction to Brian Rust's famous discography because he was listed as unknown in the personnel <laughs> to a very obscure band called Dink Rendleman and his Alabamians. <laughs> He recorded for Jeanette in 1926 or something. But I was able to tell uh, Brian that uh, the gentleman named Robert Ason was the unknown clarinet and tenor. So he, you know, he was a nice guy and he really had a feeling for the music and everything, but he had to, he had to close the magazine down. And then I... The next thing for me after collecting unemployment and translating Joe Barron's jazz book, uh, and that was a welcome little thing there. Uh, Bob Thiel, the noted producer, mostly known for his association with John Coltrane, of course, uh, it started a mag. He had a magazine when he was a kid. He was a rich kid. His father had Baker's Chocolate. And he started a magazine called Jazz in 1941, and then it folded in 1942 because that, I think he was drafted into the Coast Guard and that, that stuff. That's when he already had started Signature. He was like a wonderkind Bob deal. But then he got the yen to start a magazine again, but because he was working for other, working for Impulse, he didn't want his name associated with it. And uh, I became the first unpaid editor of this magazine called Jazz, which eventually became Jazz and Pop, but that was after I had left it. But, but he paid me off in liner notes, and he did, that's okay. uh, so. Did you <laughs> and they paid better. They paid 75 wow. bucks rather than 30 Did you ever have to write, did you ever take out an assignment to write liner notes for music that you really didn't care for? Not really. I I did have. I mean, I, I since I was not, except for that brief period when I was with with Jazz Magazine, maybe you could say that I you know depended on it. Wasn't say the main source of income for me, but I I could I could afford to say no. I mean, I I, I didn't no. I didn't I, I didn't want to write about anything that that uh, I didn't care for. Why? You know, I mean, they would try to sell somebody a, a bill of goods. I mean, but, but honestly, there may be music that was very, uh, you know, uh, good in and of itself, but I just had no particular connection with it and no particular feeling for it. I would turn it down, yes. And sometimes they must have given you different, like some liner notes, there's comments about each individual song, and some of it's more of a general thing and did you have to tailor your writing to what the record label wanted? Uh, you know, you never got, at least I didn't, you never got specific instructions. 
you, you know, from the, the notes are usually almost always assigned by the producer, except for some big labels like RCA in Columbia when there was somebody, uh, you know, who who was in in hired to. But the smaller labels didn't weren't that stratified, but they had a public relations offer that Bob Altshuler at Columbia would, you know, would somebody assign. Uh, liner notes and at RCA they also had people but usually it was the producer and uh, you would not get very specific instructions because after a while uh, you know people figured that you would have a handle on what to do but let me say this you know the uh, the uh, task of writing liner notes changed completely when LPs became CDs because the CDs were, you know, much smaller format, but not only that, but they were sealed and the notes were inside and the booklet. So in the LP era, you knew that your notes were on the back of the album and that people would go to record stores and they would read the liner notes before they bought the record. I mean, in some cases, if there was a Miles, the, the latest Miles Davis, they, you know, you didn't have to. But so you were, in a sense, you knew that you uh, uh, had uh, a an obligation at least to make the product, you know, at, at appealing. But in any case, uh, if you were writing the notes uh, and you liked the music, you didn't have to, you know, uh, try to cook up some kind of phony sales pitch. You know, the music would really speak for itself. But I found out, and there was somebody uh, after the talk yesterday. I mean, who said that. Uh, I've run into literally, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of people uh, who come up to me, and it was a little startling for me. But by now I'm 83 years old, you know. But this started when I was maybe in my 60s, and some guy who was like maybe in his 40s, you know, would come up to me and say, when I was a kid, I would read you, <laughs> you know, I was reading you in Downbeat or whatever, and I would, sure. but often I'd say, I would browse through records in the store and uh, that my liner notes were some things that would cause them to, you know, to buy a particular album, and you know, right. yeah, so you, you, you try to make but most of all, I think the obligation of the liner notes writer is to try to enhance the listening experience for the, you know, for the listener. And so I think it, it, one thing that's important is to identify soloists, you know, when they're not obvious, that's to, mostly when it comes to a band performance or whatever or if there are two people playing the same instrument or whatever. You know, and, and to point out certain things that uh, might be you know, helpful. Uh, uh, and again, I found that people have told me that uh, this was indeed so. I mean, that they learned something from what I... <laughs> and my biggest fans actually for a, a long time in the days when there were many more jazz DJs than there are now. I would get, sometimes would get notes and things from uh, from DJs saying that, how much they appreciated that I, unlike a lot of other uh, liner note writers, I would say something about each cut on the album and and I would say things like who, who was soloing and also what the tempo was, if something was a ballad or an up-tempo thing or whatever, because they said very often they didn't have time, a new record would come in and they wouldn't have time to listen to all of it and this way is what Help inform their choices of what to play, yeah, sure. Made uh, them sound yeah. more informed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I mean, one of the reasons why I did that, although I didn't start it initially, was that I've done 
quite a lot of radio overtime. I started out at WBAI in New York and uh, Gunter Schuller and and uh, Martin Williams had uh, uh, a program called uh, The Scope of Jazz and uh, Martin had to bow out and he uh, turned it over to me and so that was back in the 60s and that hand was in it also on it. Gunter was the first one to when he moved to Boston. Anyway, it was a, like a serious uh, you know, one-hour jazz Sunday night broadcast. But then uh, once I got with the Institute, we started when WBGO was the new jazz radio station in Newark back 30-some years ago. They came to us at the Institute and asked us to do a weekly program, and we decided to call it Jazz from the Archives. And so um, Ed Berger and Vincent Pilote and I and some of the other people who worked for us would take turns, you know, doing the program. And we started out with a th- station didn't have very much, and you know, they had no record library. We of course had a huge library, so. You know, Early days we were three hours a week, and then later it was back to two, and now for the last oh, 15 years or so it's been a one-hour show. But anyway, I've done a lot of radio, and I found that's very useful when you, you know, when you when you play records on the air, you know, to be able to look at a liner note and see, you know, what it says about the right. tune and so on. Uh, so, you know. Anyway, the line was, I, when I was still at, uh, at Rutgers, uh, the very nice library director, Lynn Mullins, who was a great fan of the institutes, and uh, she uh, wanted a bibliography of my liner notes. <laughs> and uh, at that time, my younger son, Josh, was... Uh, was still in in school actually he was uh, uh, well he got his BA from the from the University of Chicago but then he he went to law school first at Brooklyn College and then at Columbia but so he had some you know time in the summer so he put this thing together but I couldn't even remember all the notes that I did and it adds up to you know hundreds and hundreds wow. and about uh, uh, something like 700. <laughs> no kidding. And of the, of the Grammys you received, would, would you have said, yes, that was some of my best work? Well, as I usually would say when I, you know, when I got these Grammys, it, it's, it, it's no great, you know, it, it, it's due to the great musicians that I was able to write about and the great music that I was able to write about. My my Grammys are f- notes for, uh, I think, it was, it, yeah, for Art Tatum, for Louis Armstrong, uh, for Fats Waller, for Errol Garner, uh, for, uh, let's see, Clifford Brown. Uh, hey, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, Right. That's a heck of a good start. Yes. <laughs> wow. I was curious why, why, if you think there's a reason that women were sort of on the outside in jazz for so many years. Well, it could be several things. I mean, one, it may be the no, question of attitude, no male superiority or whatever. The other may have been, to some extent, uh, practical matter you know during the big band era the only women who were really involved were the singers and the singer usually had to hook up with one of the guys in the band either marry them or be you know the the girlfriend of in order to be you know protected from you know uh, the usual male stuff uh, so uh, that was another reason maybe why uh, even if there was a or had been uh, a really talented and competitive uh, female instrumentalist 
uh, there would have been a reluctance to, on the part of the band leader, to hire her because of the you know potential difficulties and, and then also you know with being on the road you know okay so the guys you know you can sleep on the bus you can also if you're checking to a hotel room you you know you you double up and it, 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 you know there, there are problems practical problems but uh, many also uh, there were not so many women I think who wanted to enter this whole uh, field which uh, it, a was competitive. B uh, was not, you know, uh, except by people like us, maybe highly regarded by you know members of the family or whatever. But it was mainly a, it, it 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 really is a matter of it's it's a little similar to what happened in terms of integration acceptance. You know, it's jazz people were pioneers in uh, being accepting of uh, uh, you know, African Americans. Uh, this was the, really the first public arena in which there was <coughs> integration to some you know, noticeable extent. And in terms of what was going on behind the scenes among musicians, of course, there were there was a notable absence of prejudice, which didn't matter because you know after all, the, the, most of the white musicians in jazz were inspired originally by a, a black performer. You know, I mean, uh, so it's logical. But with women, the, you know, there was a there was a, an, an attitude, and there were these practical circumstances. And there was a shortage of women who were prepared to, you know, to really uh, uh, cope with all these obstacles. So it was uh, Woody Herman had a very good trumpet player named Billy Rogers, who was in the band during World War II, and that was one moment where there was a little bit of that. You would suddenly find some female musicians in the sections of a big band. I think Lionel Hampton had a girl tenor player. Uh, there were, you know, there, there were isolated instances of that. And that's because uh, so many guys were getting drafted and there was a shortage of uh, you know, competent players. But what we have now, and this is a gradual process, as I said before, you know, with all the college bands you would see occasionally, you would see a baritone player, right. <laughs> a woman baritone player. Uh, but uh, it's changed a lot, and it's really changed for the better. And I think we're, we're seeing a, a, a lot of, there's some really good, uh, uh, what's her name, Carrington, a good drummer, you know, they're good girl drummers. Yes. and. Uh, there used to be, well, there was Shirley Scott, who was this very good organ player who established herself, uh, but Dorothy Ashby, fine harpist, uh, but she didn't live long enough, you know, to really... What about uh, race, racial, the racial issues in jazz now? Uh, now it's uh, I, I I think it's 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 pretty good now from uh, what I can see. Uh, we went through you know some ups and downs. <coughs> I was with downbeats uh, during a relatively you know uh, interesting time, mm -hmm. as in the Chinese saying, oh, "May you live in interesting times." <laughs> uh, there was a lot going on uh, in, you know, there was a, a phenomenon which was very understandable and logical and, you know, was bound to happen sooner or later. Uh, in spite of the fact that jazz was one area where there were really good relations between the races, there was a residue of built up and you know, uh, resentment among black musicians that they were unable 
to get the best jobs in the studios, uh, that they were uh, exposed to things like, you know, separate union locals where the scale for blacks was lower than for whites. You know, that was an extraordinary circumstance. Local 802 in New York was never like that. That was always, you know, integrated. But even in the, the progressive city like Chicago, you had you had two union locals and different scale. And, you know, many things like that, the, the uh, uh, yeah, so that was kind of pent up, and it came out uh, in the 60s uh, and 70s in conjunction with all the civil rights activities and the uh, much more, you know, outspoken role that was taken on by blacks, and it was bound to reflect itself in the music, too. So that, uh, then you had uh, some, you know, uh, overtones of uh, a little bit of strife there. Uh, in the magazine, I had, you know, uh, inherited um, Mary Baraka, who was then still Leroy Jones, from, uh, from uh, Don DeMichael, who had very courageously, you know, engaged uh, him as a columnist in spite of the uh, you know, uh, publisher's apprehension, you know, and let him say what he wanted to say. And then there was Rita's reaction from that, and it was interesting, and it was, you know, it, it's something that uh, was the right thing to do. So there was Archie Shep, who was somewhat of a provocateur, and at the same time, one of his best buddies and, you know, co-instrumentalists was Roswell Rudd. So, you know, I mean, there was huge, what, what, what tended to be the case, I found, is that there was a lot of talk, but when you look behind the talk, there really wasn't that much of a change in what was going on. Uh, I was, I had one very uncomfortable session uh, when there was uh, the Newport in New York had uh, in the beginning in their earlier years they they had some side events uh, panel discussions and stuff uh, and uh, I was invited to this was just around the time when I I was leaving Downbeat because I had real problems with the publisher, who was the son of the original publisher, old man Marr, who, you know, had his quirks, but I was able to get along with him, and you knew where he was coming from, and, you know, uh, his son uh, was uh, really, you know, somebody who came in without having any experience with a knowledge of jazz other than what he had absorbed in the family. Uh, and he and his father didn't get along at all, so, you know, there was a shortcut there, too. But uh, I just had to, uh, I had to leave the magazine. For, mm -hmm. and I was right in the middle of that, which, of course, nobody outside was really aware of, other than people close to me. And uh, I was asked to be on this panel, I think it was called The Drum or something. It turned out that I was the only white person along with uh, about five uh, guys who were, some of them were educators. I didn't even know most of them. One, and Max Roach, who was the, uh, uh, the moderator. And uh, some of the people on there were, uh, you know, uh, very much to the left. <laughs> and uh, I was raked over the coals, not only as, you know, as representing downbeat, that's the one thing, but then it also became, there were, you know, uh, racial matters that came into uh -huh. it. And I finally said something 
about you know I I had enough of this and it was very it 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 it, it wasn't easy and in the audience there were also some people who you know who chimed in on that and there were actually some people who were uh, in in Newark where I, I hadn't been yet because it was before the you know it was at the inst no, I wasn't with the institute yet I, uh, and uh, uh, anyway. I finally made a little speech and excuse them, and I walked out. Mm -hmm. I walked off, you know. Uh, but that was after some considerable time. So, anyway, the first person to come out and join me in the hallway was Martin Williams. You know, we were friends, and he hugged me, and he said, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, when it was over, you know, I still, I, I, I didn't go away. I stayed, I think there was something going on after that that I wanted to attend. And then Max came out, and Max and I were, you know, old uh, acquaintances. I wouldn't say that we were close friends, but we were certainly well acquainted. And then Max came over, and he actually gave me a hug too. And then he said, said, he said something interesting. He said, uh, you have to understand, he said, this, this wasn't personal. He said, this is something that we have to go through. I see. Do you think those musicians who were playing, I mean, Archie Shutt's music, just to use his name with that genre, this is music that's, let's say, challenging for the average listener. Do you think that they honestly thought that if they got the right amount of exposure in magazines and in the media, that they could sell more records? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, Archie, who is a very clever fellow and, uh, you know, very sophisticated, uh, was perfectly aware of the fact that <coughs> doing things, you know, uh, writing, expressing himself verbally, you know, and uh, doing things that were to some extent, you know, pro deliberately provocative, that that should result in people wanting to check out his music, you know, and, uh, and, and also that he might enlist uh, people who were, you know, politically on the same wavelength and so on. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it, it must be said that the, the, the avant-garde in jazz uh, was very publicity conscious. They were very much aware of the fact that if they were, you know, making provocative statements and uh, all these things. that And the music itself, of course, was aggressive, you know, so, some of it, some of it. Interestingly enough, I mean, Ornette's music was never Ornette. Very rarely, although he sometimes said things that usually had to do with recognition of his music rather than putting it on a more, you know, universal uh, socio-political platform. It was always very personal with Ornette, and Ornette's music was a thing unto itself. But uh, you know, it 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 it, it was a uh, a very interesting period, and there was the attempt uh, with the jazz and people's movement, uh, you know, to get exposure on television, which was perfectly reasonable. You know, jazz was never sufficiently well exposed on TV, but the way they went about it. And what they eventually managed to accomplish was counterproductive. You know, I mean, that was I was closely involved in that because I, you know, we were we had controversies in the pages of Downbeat. And so, on. but they went on uh, the Cavett show. They, you know, they they picketed these various television shows: Merv Griffith, uh, Cavett and uh, Ed Sullivan. And uh, on Cavett, he, because Cavett was always, you know, more, he, he was a very verbal guy, so he put musicians on a panel and talked to them. And there was Andy Cyril, 
and Freddie Hubbard and Cecil Taylor. And my God, you know, that discussion was totally, you know, like <laughs> it, it, it would not have, you know, appealed to anyone who didn't have some, you know, really inside knowledge of the music. And uh, it was off-putting because it was simply, you know, it, 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 it addressed issues that the average listener had nothing to mm. do with. Mm -hmm. And then they also said stupid things, like Freddie, whom I was very fond of, and who, poor guy, I mean, oh God, what he went through when he messed up his embouchure and then it was embarrassing to see him trying to play and then the poor guy died you know but uh, at that time it was a long time ago he was young and brass and everything but he said you know notably one totally off the wall thing he said that Coleman Hawkins was you know wrapping packages in Queens Coleman Hawkins went, first of all never went near Queens secondly he had, although his health was declining, he had a beautiful apartment in Central Park West. He had a Chrysler Imperial parked in the park. It was rusting because he wasn't using it, but God knows that he, you know. I mean, let's. Yeah. So this was really dumb stuff. And then they got on, uh, on uh, Sullivan and gave them, uh, you know, a closing five minutes. Do you remember that? I did not see that. Well, you know, and there were a bunch of people who were involved in this who were not necessarily on this same page musically, but they put together an ad hoc band that included Mingus, Archie, Rassan, and uh, I forget who the drummer was, somebody else, and, you know, what they played was, even for somebody like me who was familiar with, you know, what was then called avant-garde jazz, it was a total mess. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> and, and for anything, to try to appeal to, you know, the broad <laughs> mass of listeners, and it, 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 it just, you know, they should have played a tune, they played a song that people were familiar with, I mean, God, it, it wouldn't have been anything that uh, they had to be ashamed of, you know, to try to play something that made musical sense. But it was totally, totally out there. Yeah, I mean, so the whole thing, you know, was a, was, was a total flop. Yeah. And uh, it, it was childish. And later on, Andy, who was still very much around, uh, so is Archie, but I hardly ever see him. He isn't playing anymore, I don't think. He had a trouble with his embouchure, too. But uh, uh, Andy has been to the Institute quite a few times, and, you know, we, we, we've become friendly, you know, that's all over, yes. all that stuff, you know, that's... Uh, uh, and Rassan, who was a, a really, you know, he was a, he, he, he was a terrific person, but he was being used by these people, and they used him. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, that's all over. That's long water under the bridge, and mm -hmm. you know we don't really have any uh, any of that stuff going on anymore. But you know there are still occasions when when something will come up, and uh, there are still people who feel that until this day that there are uh, things that are wrong in the so-called music business mm -hmm. and that black artists are still being taken advantage of and that they're still and it comes up once in a while you know? yeah. well we have a, just a couple minutes left tonight recently there was a a fellow who wrote in the Jazz Educators Network about the, called it the paradox of the jazz scene and that jazz is now taught in almost every university and you have Jazz at Lincoln Center and all the high schools and the whole thing, yet record sales, you know, are very small and even the musicians who play 
the music. The young people don't buy things that much anymore. Do you have any observations on the current well, the, the whole phenomenon of jazz education is, of course, a very interesting one because it, it, as you know, as the music became less popular, less visible, <laughs> jazz education boomed. You know, there, there are hundreds of places where you can take courses in jazz. Uh, I think it's very useful because most of the people that me could have learned to play an instrument and learn to play jazz. One of the things that will stay with them and maybe. If it's for a lifetime is the fact that they can have the pleasure of playing, you know, for their own enjoyment with other people. Making a profession out of it is uh, is sometimes difficult. Yet there are people, for instance, uh, institutions like Berkeley have produced a lot of musicians who have become first-class prominent professionals. You know that, uh, uh, but. Uh, it's you know it, it it it's something. It's also uh, I guess uh, it has become a way for many. I wouldn't say failed musicians, but musicians who have been unable for one reason or another to to have uh, profitable playing careers to become you know teachers to become. Mm -hmm. the, 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 and many of them are, you know, very good, very able, uh, and it, it's it's provided also an income for you know for, for 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 really good players who couldn't you know really make a good living playing anymore. Uh, what you said about uh, record sales, uh, the industry promoted percentages have always been way off the mark because the uh, Record Industry Association, RIAA, uh, purely interested in major label products. They've never included anything, you know, from really small independent labels. They have never included jazz imports in their statistics. So when they say, you know, jazz sales only represents 3%. That was always nonsense because all you had to do was in the good old days when there were record stores like Tower, you know, if you walked into a Tower store, why would they give so much space to jazz if it wasn't selling more than 3%? That wouldn't have made any sense at all. There were, you know, really miles and miles of jazz stuff there. So this was always very questionable, but uh, nowadays, of course, most jazz record sales uh, are in the you know off statistics altogether because it's musicians selling their CDs when they go out and perform. I mean that's where you find most of it, what you see today. You go to a concert, at least that's the case in New York. There's a table. In the you know when you it, 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 there's a table there in front before, before before you enter the hall there is a table manned by a couple of people and there's stacks of CDs that represent the performers so and and when you go out in the road uh, I know people who are friends but they pack. Uh, you know, they got CDs in their car. You know, they right. got boxes of CDs. That's where the sales are, and they don't enter the official Nobody statistics. Knows. It's just like they said. You know, that CDs are uh, vanishing. They're not. I mean, it's just true in the classical field too. The same thing happens there. So there is a lot of stuff still around, but it's off. You know, yeah. off the beaten marketing path. And so, you know, okay. uh, I think people will continue to want to, to own a, 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 you know, a tangible item or something, you know, nice. that they can, you know, play for their friends or whatever, you know, all the other stuff that you can hear on your headphones, you know, and your earbuds, earbuds. you know, it's, it's out in cyberspace and yes. I think there is a proprietary instinct in people. It's the same thing with books, you know, e-books and all that. Uh, it's fine, but, you know, you still want to have, you know, 
And you also, you know, you want to be able to, you know, your friends come to visit and they see all the yeah. books. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Self-promotion. Well, we have an appointment with Amtrak, so yes, I want yes. to thank you for your Well, it's, it's, it's been, a, I've really enjoyed my, my visit to Hamilton. I always wanted to come here and uh, you've got a, a really, really lovely spot here and uh, I hope that I may be back someday yeah. and it's great that you also have all these uh, live performances here yeah. uh, that's you know that's what it's all about. That's